Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. I'm an associate professor and researcher at USF Morsani College of Medicine. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Anurag Singh joining us on today's episode. Dr. Singh is currently the Chief Medical Officer at Timeline Nutrition, a company that develops next-generation advanced nutritional products targeting improvements in mitochondrial function and muscle health. With a medical degree in internal medicine, and he has a PhD in immunology, his experience includes work for top consumer health and startup biotech companies. Uh, he's co-authored uh, 40 different top tier articles in, in medical journals. He's conducted uh, over 50 randomized controlled trials in nutrition, including research on the postbiotic urolithin A. We're going to take a deep dive into the science and potential applications of urolithin A, including uh, the effects on mitophagy and the emerging applications on muscle strength. Before we dive in, I want to say a special thanks to our sponsors. Please know that these partners really help us continue to provide you with free content. Uh, so by supporting these products, you are supporting the Metabolic Link podcast, and we appreciate your support. Genova Connect is our sponsor for this episode. Genova Connect is powered by Genova Diagnostics, and they offer a simple at-home advanced lab testing that's backed by research. Really takes the guesswork out of understanding your health. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Genova Diagnostics, have been for quite some time. Uh, I've used a number of their products, including the Metabolomics Plus Kit. So this uh, does urine and a blood spot measurement. It looks at things like oxidative stress, mitochondrial function. We'll measure the omega-3 levels, uh, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, methylation balance. Uh, another thing that it does, it measures uh, your exposure to different toxins, including heavy metals. Genova Connect is offering you a 15% off their test kits when you use the code metabolic at gdx.net slash the metabolic link. Element is also a sponsor of this episode. Element is a zero sugar electrolyte hydration drink. Uh, I've been using Element for pretty much every day for the last five years, I would say since 2019. Uh, typically, I use a packet in the morning uh, when I first wake up, and uh, I also take a packet in the afternoon, especially pre-workout. The taste is amazing. Uh, I'm drinking the watermelon salt here, and uh, they have these sample packs that have a lot of really cool flavors. Element is offering an exclusive deal to our listeners. So by using their link, uh, you get a free uh, Element sample pack, and with any drink purchase, when you visit drinklmnt.com slash metabolic link. Now here's my interview with Dr. Singh. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much for joining us on the Metabolic Link podcast. Um, and I really want to dive into your background as a medical doctor uh, trained in internal medicine and also uh, having a PhD in immunology. Mm -hmm. uh, I was... I'm, always very interested in people's career path. So uh, I would love to know how you got interested in uh, nutrition supplementation and your field of research. Sure. Yeah, so, well, I, I trained uh, in one of the top medical schools in India. I was first in the family to actually ever go to med school. And and it, when I graduated, uh, you know, everybody wanted to, of course, get into a speciality. I, I felt at least at that time, um, this was 23 years, 24 years back in my home country, which is India, there was not a lot of uh, opportunities to do good medical research. And so I applied for this physician scientist uh, award that you know allows you to go to US universities. So I ended up in a US university and, and working with uh, MDs who were doing research. And one of them actually convinced me to, to actually do full-time research and not just a uh, one day research like most MDs uh, were doing at that time. And, uh -huh. and got into a PhD in immunology. Uh, my exposure to nutrition happened because in the same laboratory I was in, in, in the University of Connecticut in the US, um, uh, I was uh, working very closely with a bunch of naturopaths who were also getting their PhD in immunology. There was a big push to bring naturopathic doctors and get them into you know, really doing uh, deep science approach sort of. 
And one of the compounds uh, was a compound from stem of the pineapples. It's called bromelain. And uh, we, we were comparing it to steroids and in different models and different trials to asthma patients. And we're just, you know, it was so much safer and do so many great things. And so that actually was a trigger of my interest in nutrition research. Uh-huh. Cool. cool. Uh, like in what year was that? Just so I'm kind of like, <laughs> yeah, so I trained I, 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 in Colonel right? Medicine in uh -huh. early 2000. Then I moved to the U S uh, and then got my PhD in immunology between 2003 to 2008. And then, okay. uh, you know, all, all this exposure happened in during that time to, to translational research. I was doing a lot of trials. I'm actually trained as a lung immunologist. So I was working yeah. a lot with asthmatic children, et cetera. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a, a recruiter from uh, from a company in Switzerland called Nestle actually reached out to me yes, and said yeah. they were looking for for uh, MDs who who had a, a research background to see if you know they could bring um, more clinical trials that that pharma does in the nutrition space. And so okay. around about two thousand eight nine, I moved to Switzerland. Okay. Yeah. I was asking about the date because it just looks like you've spearheaded so many clinical trials and have been been involved in this research for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, and when someone told me about, uh, mitopure or urolithin yeah. A, uh, many people will jump to Google, but, uh, I had not heard of it before, uh, about a year or so ago. And th so I jumped on PubMed and mm -hmm. I was really astonished by the level of research, high quality peer reviewed sure. questions that have been done on urolithin A and how it has not been, you know, firmly put on my radar for some time. And, uh, let me just, I just had, uh, PubMed pulled up here. So I'll just read some of the ones that actually you're, you're involved in the first one that maybe we'll talk about, uh, read some of the, uh, the titles of some of these publications on PubMed. And I encourage people to go to PubMed, uh, you know, search urolithin A, and you're going to find at least like 400 publications on this compound. It's very interesting science, uh, that we're going di to dive into, uh, but at the top of the list here, urolithin A improves muscle strength, exercise performance, and biomarkers of mitochondrial health in a randomized trial in middle-aged adults. Uh, another study, urolithin A improves mitochondrial health, reduces cartilage degeneration, and alleviates pain and osteoarthritis. Uh, that was uh, aging cell. Uh, another one here, C. elegans. I had a, a PhD, former PhD student do work in C. elegans. Ur urolithin A induces mitophagy, which uh, I have a lot of questions about sure. and prolongs lifespan in C. elegans, uh, nematodes and increases muscle function in rodents. Uh, the last one, there's so many here, but another uh, really interesting one, urolithin A protects against acetaminophen induced liver injury in mice sustained uh, via sustained activation of NRF2. Uh, I have a postdoctoral fellow from the Moffitt Cancer Center who did her PhD work on NRF2. So very very interesting to me. Um, so yeah, so we have everything from C. elegans to rodent models to human <laughs> randomized controlled trials mm -hmm. on urolithin A. And uh, and I would like to kind of uh, just kind of dive into the research a little bit. Most of what you do, uh, Dr. Singh, is, is mostly uh, clinical trial work yeah, on so this compound, right? So I've been running clinical trials on this molecule for t almost, well, 10 years now. So uh, we've, we've done a few... In addition, go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the registry to see you, you'll find close to 15 randomized trials uh, almost that we run in the last 10 years on this, just this molecule. And, and, and so the this, this story, just to kind of give you the, the background, how it all started, um, you know, a lot of times in nutrition, uh, the, at least the 15, 20 years back, the, there was not enough science, uh, the, the biotech way of doing research, right? So, you know, you, you, you figure out how some of these natural compounds uh, hit certain parts of the biology, then you figure out the mechanism, and then you translate it into humans. So at that about 15 years back, uh, some of the professors in uh, the Swiss Institute of Technology, where we were actually based out of, uh, even till today, the company was spun out with this ideology to do basically deconstruct uh, wonder fruits like pomegranates and berries that have all these health benefits. And that's how it all started, you know, and, and uh, we started studying polyphenols uh, and a professor called Johan Ovrix um, in the EPFL, he was looking at different compounds. There are at least 500 compounds in the pomegranate that are bioactives. 
And we only found one that was actually doing all these benefits. And it turns out that's the story you were just saying, uh, okay. 400 papers since then on urolithin that, A. That was urolithin A. Okay. So urolithin A is a really interesting compound, uh, you know, just kind of pulling not only the PubMed articles, but, you know, looking at like what's on your uh, Wikipedia and things like that. You're, it's a pre, urolithin A is a postbiotic and the precursor is uh, a gallic acid, a polyphenol, my understanding. Uh -huh. So yep. uh, this particular polyphenol, as you mentioned, is high in, uh, in pomegranates. It's high in walnuts. Uh, actually, the the fruit that, that was highest, according to some charts that I saw on two different websites, were raspberries, in particular, uh -huh. yellow raspberries, which uh -huh. I wasn't even aware. Uh -huh. I mean, it was like sort of 900 relative to the pomegranate. However, you know, uh, I assumed that to get the 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 level that you tested in in peer reviewed publications, I think it was like five hundred to a thousand milligrams per day. Yeah. One would need to consume, uh, and you know, our audience is just a lot of people follow low carb diets, lower mm -hmm. carb diets, and ketogenic diets. I would assume that you'd need to consume a significant amount of pomegranate juice and lots of sugar, for example, to get five hundred to a thousand milligrams, but. I also noticed that uh, there's quite a few studies on urolithin A that kind of uh, looked at the food sources sure. of urolithin A. And I think more recently, I guess the work that you're doing is directly studying this postbiotic compound. So I guess the question for you is like, are there, would there be additional benefits uh, for someone who, for example, like me, I consume probably a, a half a cup of, of uh, walnuts per day and, and raspberries too. They're two staple in my diet, uh, mixed yep. berries. So would, would there be any additional benefits for someone um, to consume supplemental urolithin A? Yeah, so th that's the one great thing you can do. So you can have a very healthy diet with a lot of fruits and nuts and I, I, I guess uh, fiber, of course, that feeds your, nourishes your microbiome. The second is actually this microbiome. Uh, part of the puzzle is, is, is our gut microbiome. So we've run... We've gone into different uh, geographies, French, Germans, Canadians, Americans, and we've actually looked how many people, if you gave them a glass of pomegranate, pure pomegranate juice with, with all the elagic acid and what we call elagic tannins, the polyphenols, how many would actually convert? Um, and, and we see actually um, the French have the highest, so maybe that's the French paradox part of the puzzle, uh, is the gut microbiome. So the French have a let's say they've been eating a lot of fermented foods, et cetera, they, 30% or 40% of the French population has some circulating levels of urolithin A. And if you give them a glass of juice, a lot of them will give decent exposure to the molecule, still not enough. And they, in the range will be very variable to get a consistent effect in a randomized trial. If you go to, if you go to Canada in the US, you only have 12% people, uh, which means their gut microbiome is a totally shot. Uh, we've actually... Um, looked at very closely at the gut microbiome of people who can endogenously naturally make it versus those who can't. And it's really the, the part of the puzzle in addition to the diet is you're saying is the gut microbiome. So you need to be one of those one third lucky ones yeah. who have the right gut microbiome. Okay. That, okay. So that brings up an interesting question. Uh, is there any potential synergy with taking uh, or uh, are, are there any, because urolithin A is already converted over from, uh, again, you know, it's already the post, but you're taking the postbiotic already. So that, mm -hmm. so there's no, if 12% of the, the population can, can, you know, only convert this, are there any, uh, prebiotic fibers or probiotic supplements that would give the bacterial composition, uh, that, that could help to, or, is it like, you know, if your microbiome is is disrupted early on in life through various environmental factors or, uh, you know, factors that we still don't understand, is would that, you know, compromise the production of urolithin A forever? Uh, can you so, recover that? It's a great question and I think a very relevant one. Um, I'll give you my example. Born and raised in India, uh, almost uh, from everything from a common cold to a sneeze, they give you antibiotics. Uh, I didn't know till I actually started studying um, how this microbiome phenomena. So I once drank and I still can drink six glasses of pomegranate juice, which as you said, will have 30 grams of sugar. My body just refuses to convert. Even though I think I take a lot of probiotics, I try to eat a fiber rich diet and I thought I could recondition my microbiome from the early damage uh, that mm -hmm. antibiotics probably caused in my young years. It has not been the case. So, 
I think the approach of supplementing uh, through different probiotics is an interesting one. Uh, we've looked at, uh, we've sequenced the microbiome of these producers who actually make uh, urolithin A, and turns out it's not one. So you would need a very complex um, ecosystem um, to, to sort of, what we do see is they have more acromanzia, for example. The, uh, mm-hmm. Now, is acromanzia just a sign of a rich and diverse gut microbiome that is conducive to uh, producing UA, or it's actually involved in the conversion? We don't know yet. But I I mean, we have given people pomegranate juice over a long time and see how many would from 12% go, they go to like, you can get to like 30, 40% at some level. So you can probably recondition, Mm -hmm. uh, but the exposure won't be enough to give you therapeutic health benefits. Yeah, that's interesting. You you mentioned acromancia. Uh, It sort of helps to produce the mucus uh, barrier layer. Uh, it. I was actually going to ask about that because the ketogenic, the anti-convulsant, anti-seizure effects of the ketogenic diet have been linked, at least in a few studies, to uh, expansion of acromancia in the microbiome. So uh, that, that's always been something you know I've been interested in. When, when you talk about when you're measuring and quantifying, if you're taking, uh, if you're eating these foods and you want to measure urolithin A, or you're taking yep. a, uh, the urolithin A supplement, might appear. Uh, how do we, what, what biome can we directly, is there a way to measure, uh, probably not commercially available, but what yeah. biomarkers should we be looking at to indicate that, uh, to basically quantify our either production of urolithin A or that the supplement is actually making it and, and getting into circulation. So we, we're funny you say this. So, so we actually, we have developed a test. So I have uh, bled several of my fingers over the years oh, to develop oh, this uh. test. It's a simple finger prick test. You, you use a uh, filter paper. It's called a dry blood spot uh, mm-hmm. card. And you just put a few drops, three to four drops of blood. And and uh, you can uh, send it to a partner lab and, and they'll be able to. And the way we have structured the test is that you actually try a glass of pomegranate juice. So we actually, in the test, send you uh, two cards, one that you try to see if, what's your natural level of exposure. And, mm-hmm. and, and then you take uh, a single dosing of our product to see the, 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 the increase in, in the, and even if you're making it, you know, not everybody, as you said, is drinking a glass of juice or eating a bowl of raspberries every day. So you can adjust the intake because, you know, in the nutrition field, that's the missing link, right? Is personalizing. Everybody's told to take a gram of vitamin C. Nobody really knows how much you need and where it goes. So it's not commercial yet, but the aspiration is to commercialize this test. But there's a clinical trial in if your audience is interested in participate. Uh, I can drop the link and and they can uh, enroll and see what their blood levels of urolithin A are before and after. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, uh, that is much needed level of innovation when it comes to not only natural compounds, but even like all drug companies should have some kind of drug you know, spot card where, you know, because food impacts, you know, drug metabolism and everybody has different, different pharmacokinetics. Uh, so that's a good lesson for other people listening out there. If you're developing compounds to develop some sort of, uh, measurement system. So, uh, urolithin A is, is one of those is, is a compound that induces something called mitophagy. And we, we actually study, I just came from a glycogen storage, uh, disease type two, uh, which is uh, pomp disease. So, so there's a impairment of autophagy in the lysosomes. So mitophagy is kind of interesting. And for autophagy, we look at things like LC3, P62. So uh, experimentally, can you explain the mechanism of urolithin-induced mitophagy? In addition to that, can you uh, tell our listeners like how you go about experimentally measuring and quantifying mitophagy? Sure. Yeah. So you know, yeah, the mitochondria, as every you know, probably your audience is very familiar with this organelle is producing energy. As we age, what happens is that uh, in a life cycle of a mitochondria, they go from being healthy, so producing a lot of energy currency, which is ATP, to being unhealthy. And when they are unhealthy, uh, they all accumulate. And and then they put a sort of eat me signal. But the mechanisms that allow the recycling of these bad mitochondria, they slow down with aging. That's It happens at a global cellular level, and that's what we call autophagy. 
But if it's uh, targeted to mitochondria, we call it mitophagy. So what happens with a lot of uh, conditions of aging like uh, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease is that mitophagy slows down, right? And so you get all these uh, faulty mitochondria. Now, what uh, urolitinaeo mitopure does, it, it basically uh, tags these and, and sort of increases the mitophagy process. So now think of it like a, like a trash uh, pickup truck arriving at your house more regularly to pick up trash, right? And that's what starts happening more and more. So you're cleaning out the waste, and this waste actually becomes the building block for newer healthy mitochondria. So you start mitophagy, and that induces what we call biogenesis, which means now you have more near healthy mitochondria coming. How do we measure it? Uh, we have different tools to measure uh, mitophagy or mitochondrial biogenesis uh, from worms all the way to rodents to, to humans. Uh, in humans, we take uh, muscle biopsies or, or we take uh, white blood cells, for example, and, and we look at uh, markers of biogenesis like PGC1 alpha, and you can look mm -hmm. at that in simple tools like flow cytometry, or you can take muscle biopsies and you can get uh, protein lysates and look at what we call Western blots. So that's how we actually quantify. And we are now actually doing what we call non-invasive measures of uh, mitochondrial health that requires a bit more of a setup. It requires an MRI machine and we can do things like uh, magnetic spectroscopy where people mm -hmm. exercise in the, in the MRI machine and they deplete their ATP, and then we can see how quickly the ATP is coming back, uh, which gives us a sign of uh, good mitochondria. And we also do look at VO2, which is sort of a, a de facto way to look at mitochondrial health. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would seem like the the ultimate, <laughs> you know, objective biomarker to look at VO2 max. So, so that's something that you're looking at too. Yeah, we do that uh, all in all our trials. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So, uh, so. For mitophagy, you know, if you fast uh, or do, you know, intermittent fasting, things like that, or intense exercise, you know, that can increase mitophagy. But sure, what we're talking about is a molecule that is in some way augmenting uh, the cellular signaling to identify damaged mitochondria and break them down, similar to the process of autophagy, but specifically for the organelle, mm -hmm. uh, for the mitochondria. So, um, yeah. So I assume there's a certain level of urolithin A that needs to get sort of in circulation to uh, induce that. And that may experimentally differ in cell-based assays, animal studies. Uh, there's different forms of urolithin A out there and just like doing a search. And I saw that there's a lysosomal urolithin A. Is there, there's also a urolithin B. <laughs> when I type in urolithin A in uh PubMed, uh, urolithin B came up and I didn't get to look at, you know, those studies, what urolithin B even is, but, uh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, sort sure. of what makes maybe the timeline product different, the bioavailability and also a uh, urolithin B. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So back to how elagic acid is absorbed in, in when you're eating a bowl of berries or, or, um, drinking glass of pomegranate juice. Uh, the main uh, metabolite uh, that, so these are complex uh, polyphenolic compounds and what the gut microbiome is doing is digesting them and releasing, releasing them as simpler molecules. That's why we call them postbiotics. And urolitin A is the major urolitin that is found in circulation, okay? Uh, the other types are urolitin B, C, and D that have been looked upon. Uh, C and D are so low in circulation, uh, albeit we have seen at least in animal research that they have very similar effects, but to reach the levels uh, needed in cell culture or animal models, you really need to dose a lot of these molecules. Urolitin B is the second more common ones, and, and we think it has a lot of potential uh, as a molecule, but just because urolitin A is the major, 50% of people have that as the major metabolite. When we first started, uh, we developed this, uh, we studied its safety, we established what we call the the, the grass limit. So the, you know, we got an FDA grass uh, on this. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have to repeat the whole due diligence and doing the hard tox work and doing the RCTs on purified urolitin B to get to where urolitin A is, for example. Um, so that's the difference. Now, why is timeline urolitin A different than others? Uh, well, there are a few, uh, let's say, copycats there. Um, uh, again, as a, somebody doing research on for 10, 15 years, 
we have, of course, uh, uh, done a lot of research and done a lot of clinical trials. These folks are just using all our data uh, to try and sell because they're realizing mm -hmm. that companies are now, uh, people are familiar with the benefits of this molecule. We have actually looked at and warned the FDA and 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 uh, Amazon, for example. We have bought a few of these, and they hardly have any urolitone. Uh, it's all coming from China, so we have a very high quality, made in US uh, product uh, that is safe and clinically studied. Versus, you don't know what what is in the product and what is its safety profile, kind of. So, yeah, that's essentially the competition. Mm -hmm. Is urolithin A, uh, is it lipophilic? Is that why I saw there's you know, liposomal compounds and yeah. uh, would it, would that then, uh, you know, would it be beneficial to take urolithin A with a higher fat meal or it is. Uh, with lipids like omega-3 fatty acids, something like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So urolithin A has very less solubility in, uh, in, in, uh, for example, in water. Uh, but if you mix it in uh, MCTs or f other kinds of fats or protein, high protein matrix, it it, uh, it uh, absorbs very, very nicely. And so mm -hmm. actually our products are mixed with MCTs uh, or median oh, chain okay. triglyceride as they're called mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to, to and, and these formulations deliver even an enhanced uh, level of urolithinase. You're right, it's, it's lipophilic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the stability of the compound too is it's stable it, over time, and and it does it cross the blood brain barrier too? Do we know? Yeah, that? so mm -hmm. so it, it it is one of the most ro stable, robust compounds I've ever worked with, or anybody who has worked with urolithin A in the field. Uh, you can put it out in the harshest of uh, temperature, humidity conditions. After three years, it'll, it'll, it'll behave the same way. So mm -hmm. the other good thing compared to other molecules uh, in the space that hit mitochondria, like NAD boosters, for example, uh, that are not stable, uh, they, they kind of dissociate. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. This one doesn't, and it's, you know, um, so it, it's, uh, it's inert. It doesn't smell anything compared to fish oil, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I assume a certain like baseline level you need to, because uh, from the studies that I read, it seems to have an accumulative effect over time. And I yeah. wonder if that's because it's building up in tissue. So uh, this kind of invites the question as one would do with, if they're starting up creatine monohydrate, for example, they front load it or they do a loading phase. Mm -hmm. And as someone just starting to use a supplement, <laughs> urolithin A, and, and I, I, I don't, it could be placebo, but I already feel like I'm getting some kind of energy, you know, boosting effects from it. Uh, but I'm only two weeks in and I don't know if the studies really show any benefit. Would there be a benefit to front loading it in the beginning to get levels, tissue levels up? Has that been looked at? Not in detail. So typically mm -hmm. we, uh, in our randomized trials, what we did was in the fir very first trial, we went and we did what is called as dose escalation trial, which, where, which means we took the dose that was translating from these early rodent studies that you were talking about, uh, which translated to 250 milligrams equivalent in humans. So we first gave it a cohort of people 250. We saw it was bio bioavailable, but it wasn't really in, let's say, four weeks of intake, uh, we saw some mitochondria turning on, but it wasn't enough. And then we went higher to 500 milligram in another cohort of people. And there we saw the, when we did the biopsies and looked at the blood cells that the mitochondria were sort of uh, reversing and we saw more biogenesis and then a gram was the best. And then beyond that, we kept doubling. We started the, the what we call linear pharmacokinetics starts to plateau. So it's not always like, you know, uh, yeah. so I think back to your question. Um, which and what is, was that time frame where you saw changes in mitochondria after administrating 500 million? So milligrams? we see deep biological effects in about a month uh, already. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, mitophagy happens very quickly. If, you know, if you read the Nature Medicine paper mm -hmm. from Professor Johan Ovrix, so mitophagy is probably the first thing that happens. You get rid of your faulty mitochondria in about let's say the first week. And that gives a signal for biogenesis to start happening, which we pick up very nicely in about four weeks in overweight people, in old people, uh, and, and even in immune cells, for example, we pick it up. And then to, we have to, we have done trials of two to four months to really start seeing physiological benefits. So it's again, not a, a, a magic pill. It takes time to work on your yeah. mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And two months we start improving peak VO2 and things like that. And about four months we see better older people having more endurance and, and uh, better strength. 
and lower inflammation. So I'm a mm-hmm. trained immunologist, and I think one of the most consistent features in all the trials we run, we pick up is, is a dampening of uh, it. In addition to being a mitochondrial rejuvenator, it, it dampens and is in like an anti-inflammatory. Oh, it, and so uh, one thing that I measure frequently is um, like HSCRP, just as a so sure. Sure. So with, that's what we use with, in all the trials. Oh, and that's okay. if you look at all the trials that we and others have talked about, I think the mm-hmm. unanimous finding you'll find is that HR, HSCRP levels go down uh, significantly across the different, even in top athletes who, who, who take it, for example. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge believer that, you know, uh, systemic inflammation is like a major driver for neurological diseases and cancer. Yep, me too. too. Yeah. And that, that brings up, uh, so I, I think, you know, we talked a little, a lot about the mechanisms and, and what your lithin A is. And I'd, I'd like to talk about the emerging applications of your lithin A and there's, yep. uh, direct people to PubMed. There's quite a lot of research on this, mostly in the, the area of aging, uh, but, I, but I also noticed that there is our skin formulation. So is, is urolithin A, is it, uh, transdermally, uh, tra- is it transported across the, the dermis and can it get into circulation where you can measure it, uh, with transdermal application? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we first launched a product this is about three years back, a lot of the early adopters started telling us that the oral product was having, uh, um, in addition to feeling energy after taking it over a few months, they were felt visually something was happening and their skin looked a bit hydrated and things like this. And that got us thinking, huh, maybe, you know, what if you actually bought a cream and put uh, your Latine and, and tried it out? And so that's how we started uh, actually in the topical space. So we started looking at all the 50 plus year olds and we did skin biopsies and we looked at the mitochondria and we saw that even with aging in the skin, you, you had a very similar profile of depleted mitochondria that you were seeing in, in muscles or immune cells, or even, you know, we haven't done the mm-hmm. brain trial yet, but potentially that could happen in the brain. And then we did all these randomized trials in skin where we applied a cream uh, with a certain dose of MitoPure and we could see the mitochondria coming back to life, much like we saw in the muscle. And that longer term means uh, we see better skin hydration. We see lowering of the wrinkles because mitochondria do make collagen, uh, for example. Mm-hmm. And so with aging, collagen gets boosted. And and it does go to different layers of the skin. Um, uh, now we haven't really looked at the blood levels after applying it uh, on, on the skin. I must mm-hmm. mention that. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, is there any advantage to bypassing first pass metabolism through the liver, for example? It's a good point. Can, yeah, it's a good know, point. I, I, I think we thought of it, you know, that, you know, initial 10 years of our research was all in the muscle space and trying to figure muscle aging, but we realized that aging is more than one organ, right? I mean, muscle is a key longevity organ, but, if you're hitting immune cells, if you're hitting muscle cell uh, cells, possibility mitochondria are ubiquitous, right? They're in every cell type other than red blood cells. So mm-hmm. you're gonna have probably a sort of a 360 effect in all different or, uh, organs. And so that's what allowed us to go and say, hey, take the oral supplements, but do topical and that regimen together will probably have a deep effect. Uh, and that's a trial actually mm-hmm. we, we, are, we, we, are, we plan to run now. Yeah. It's just a site specific effect where you're obviously just getting higher, you know, concentration. Yeah. You're just getting right a direct the effect yeah. on the, mm-hmm. on the tissue organ. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I know with like things like senolytics and maybe just like autophagy in general, as we age, mm-hmm. you know, uh, there's a, there's a lot of supplements that may be more beneficial for the aging population. And, uh, and I don't know enough about enhancing mitophagy if it would benefit people more like in older life? Uh, or, you know, is this something that people that are younger, I, I know maybe people that are, I don't know, you'd maybe know more than me, but, uh, maybe you wouldn't want to take senolytic <laughs> compounds, uh, and, and maybe even activating autophagy if you're in your twenties or thirties. Uh, is there a reason, is there any, any, additional benefits to older people with urolithin A relative to younger people? Because I think some of the work has been done with middle-aged and, and just older folks. Yeah, so you're correct. So the, most of the trials we've done is comparing 70-year-olds and, you know, who don't move around uh, too much their sedentary lifestyle. And because 
as a trialist, you need to give yourself, you know, the best chance to see it because there's a mitochondrial dysfunction in that population. You start there, mm -hmm. and then we work backwards and 50 year olds who are a bit overweight. So again, being overweight is causing some sort of mitochondrial stressor. Uh, we were actually approached by uh, one of the top sports nutrition researchers a few years back. And, and she said, well, my, my athletes are all going to Olympics or they are competitive uh, athletes. They, they run these three to five kilometer races. Uh, we track them over time, their performance dips. And we think overtraining, we, the data we are seeing is that overtraining is inducing mitochondrial dysfunction, even in these. Mm. And I said, well, it's, that sounds crazy that, you know, that a 25, 30 year old top uh, athlete with probably their best muscle and mitochondrial health is getting impacted. So they actually just ran a trial that uh, we hopefully get to publish very soon, but they see that uh, if, you know, even things like peak VO2 were improved, but the, the real effect was on the recovery part of, of the piece. So, um, and by that, I mean, even these athletes get highly inflamed and, and they have muscle damage happening at a very high rate. And so the body just can't cope up with the, with the constant, even though they might are in good shape, you know, the balance tilts uh, because the demand is so high. And, and so that uh, the effect we're seeing is really on the, on the recovery part. These people feel uh, they can recover from inflammation very fast. So mm -hmm. I think there are benefits to trying even early, but definitely after you hit your forties, because that's, you know, where we see uh, the healthy aging and improving health span as a main uh, theme of this uh, mm -hmm. research. Yeah. So uh, augmenting the adaptive responses to training over time, which makes sense that, you know, the compound could be used more of as, as a training aid and that's yep. a mitochondrial, you know, mm -hmm. metabolic dependent function, being able to adapt uh, with clearing, you know, when you do skeletal muscle damage, if you're doing resistance training or just even prolonged endurance training. So, so in regards to, uh, other emerging applications, um, uh, muscle wasting or sarcopenia is pretty, seems like the obvious application based on the clinical mm -hmm. trials. Uh, mm -hmm. but w we do research on, uh, muscle wasting diseases that could include inborn errors of metabolism, but also uh, cancer cachexia. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, if there's any research in the pipeline or, or that has been done on the effects of urolithin A and different, you know, cancer models and perhaps cancer cachexia, yeah. especially with the, the cancer cachexia is typically driven by inflammation sure. uh, too, in part. So yeah, no, curious great, your thoughts on that. Great, great point. So we are right now doing two studies, one with uh with Professor Stu Phillips and McMaster. Um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. he has this model that induces very rapid muscle atrophy. And, and the way he does induce the rapid muscle atrophy is by putting knee mobilization aid. So in one mm -hmm. leg. And so you can actually take very young college athletes and kind of in two weeks, if you put this, uh, they don't get to walk around. You lose about 10% of your muscle mass very rapidly uh, in, a, in this sort of, uh, so basically immobilization. So it's yeah. like sarcopenia or, uh, you know, if you get hospitalized for a week or two weeks and you're, you're lying around on a bed, you lose a lot of your muscle. So it's kind of mimicking that. And so we are comparing high protein alone to high protein plus mitopure. And the goal is to see, can we boost up a mitochondrial protein synthesis rates and B, can we recover a lot of that uh, uh, muscle atrophy that is happening in this uh, mm -hmm. setting where high protein is probably the only thing right now people are recommending. Mm -hmm. But even in older adults, as you probably know, you hit this anabolic threshold to, to, to yeah. metabolizing. So can you anabolic break that? Resistance. Yeah. yeah, can you break that anabolic mm -hmm. resistance by rewiring your mitochondria? So that's one stream of research. We are also doing two cancer trials, by the way, mm. one with the National Cancer Institute and prostate cancer uh, before people go into elective surgery uh, to give them mitopures. And this is uh, fully funded by the, the, the NCI. Uh, and, and they want to see what is happening at a oxidative stress level in the cancer tissue and can we mm -hmm. negate sort of the outcomes. But the, the real key trial is uh, post-cancer, where, where I think after beating cancer, after doing neoadjuvant, uh, which is chemo radio, basically, people lose, yeah. they're almost frail and they have no immune system. And, and, and the two yep. strongest effects we are seeing is on the muscle and immune. So I think we're now mm -hmm. doing a trial there to see if the immune system can come back better and the muscle fatigue can come back better in post-cancer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Look, after cancer. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, cause a lot of chemotherapeutic agents and even radiation kill cancer cells through an oxidative stress mechanism. And with the antioxidant, you know, potential and, and that could be potentially, I mean, theoretically conceivably maybe like offsetting some of the cancer killing yeah. effects of the pro-oxidant yeah. therapies. So being able to, yeah, recover muscle function and, um, yeah, chemotherapy is pretty damaging to the mitochondria. So it makes sense yeah. for, but also, uh, you know, post surgery, post therapy, but I'm also thinking from a general perspective, we are of the opinion that healthy mitochondria are the ultimate tumor suppressor. So if you enhance mitochondrial function, the bioenergetic state of the cell is enhanced yeah. in a way that, uh, enhances and preserves the fidelity of the nuclear genome where DNA repair, you know, is, can go on, uh, and, and you're preserving the mitochondria. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA, but also the mitochondria's effect on the nuclear DNA. So that's sort of like this theory that we have. It's not our theory, but you know, sort of advanced by Thomas Seyfried and many others now working in the field. No, so I agree yeah. with that theory. I, I, I certainly think what you'll see is a lot of immune metabolism research coming up. You know, how do yeah. mitochondria cross talk with different immune responses? We just wrapping up another trial with the Buck Institute of Aging, mm -hmm. where we are looking at, uh, you know, deep immunophenotyping. So you basically, what happens at the T cell level and uh, all the cytolytic yep. cancer fighting T cells. Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, if any work has been done, for example, uh, you know, mice and rats typically don't die of like cardiovascular disease. They usually die of like organ failure, but uh, typically like cancer, they get, they form spontaneous tumors as they yep. age. Yep. And an interesting study, uh, I would be interested in conducting, we're doing it in different models, but, uh, to look at, for example, over one to two years, or maybe taking middle-aged mice at like one year, and then looking at the, the generation or the suppression of spontaneous tumors, like over mm -hmm. time in the absence and presence of like using something like urolithin A, it seems like that could be a promising area of research considering the, the anti-inflammatory effects and the mitochondrial sure. enhancement effects. No, 200% agree. I think, you know, as a small company, you, you take the burden to raise the bar of research, but you can't do everything yourself, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, we're now partnering and, and a lot of people are uh, uh, one of the teams which we haven't really been chasing, but other top academics like yourself are doing is, is brain aging because they see it. I think I didn't answer mm -hmm. one of your questions. It is penetrate into the brain. It does. Yeah. And, and they see all these great effects in uh, neurodegeneration. And the second mm -hmm. is cancer. I think if you just go to PubMed and type your in cancer in the last three years, you'll see almost 20 publications. So it's a hot area wow. of research. Wow. Really cool. Um, so are there any other applications that you'd like to kind of tell our, our listeners about that, that you think are very promising? Like, you know, we, we tend to study different rare diseases. So I'm interested in, yeah. you know, applying it to those model systems, but curious. yeah, I mean, clinical trials, no, but, uh, we haven't really done in rare diseases because again, this is a supplement. If you test it out, for example, for, for a muscle wasting disease, um, caused by mutations in mitochondrial DNA, et cetera, then gets classified as a drug trial. So yeah. as a company, we can't really do, but there are investigators mm -hmm. who have come to us. Um, we have published with professor Johan Obricks, uh, um, in DMD models, for example, mm -hmm. um, a, a very nice science translational medicine paper, uh, where, where it was shown that uh, giving urolithin A in these DMD models could recover a lot of the loss of muscle force and strength that happens in these DMD and the mitochondrial defects mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's a lot of rare disease research going yeah. around with urolithin A. The one area I see upcoming is, is uh, inflammation in the gut autoimmunity a lot mm -hmm. uh, because this molecule, I mean, it's made in the gut. Uh, when you take it, 90% of it gets absorbed in the gut until the rest of it comes out in the bloodstream. So I personally think as an immunologist that it has a lot of potential for gut uh, barrier, boosting gut barrier function and and things like inflammatory, you know, uh, bowel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Working directly like on the tight junctions or yeah, exactly. enhancing that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, are there any, you know, are there any things that would be, I just want to talk a little more broadly about mitochondrial function and sure. other mitochondrial kind of antioxidants. Are, is there anything that 
in your opinion, that would be synergistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, many, many, you know, people like to take multiple, you know, yeah, compounds sure. and yep. like, whether it be cre- like something proven like creatine or yep. coenzyme Q10, or I take alpha lipoic acid, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, so are, are there anything that would in particular work synergistically with urolithin A or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we mm-hmm. haven't uh, done trials uh, adding different things, but at certainly at a cellular level, we we have explored that. Um, so you know, you can hit mitochondria three different ways. You can increase the number of mitochondria. That's biogenesis, and there are compounds like NAD boosters. So there's things like nicotinamide riboside, uh, or or even vitamin B3 is a known um, agent. Resveratrol is another one. And you can, in the second bucket is your efficiency, mitochondrial efficiency booster. So mm-hmm. that's what you were saying with creatine, CoQ10, or L-carnitine. Yeah. These are typical. Um, and so we have looked at and combined them, and, and we see definitely synergy with uh, NAD boosters. So kind of cleaning mm-hmm. out the waste and, and adding on and boosting uh, biogenesis even further. We've combined them with uh, L-carnitine and, and CoQ10, and we, we, we see definitely synergy happening at a cellular level. Mm-hmm. Now, how, how would we do the trials and how can we do that is, is a longer discussion. In, yeah. In the future. These things need to be tested in isolation. So uh, we, we've done a lot. I don't know if you know about the research we've done, but we sort of advanced the science and the application of exogenous ketones about mm-hmm. like 15 years ago. We've got mm-hmm. you know dozens of patents on various... Uh, dozens of different ketogenic molecules from, you know, the simple 1,3-butanediol to various ketogenic esters and ketone mm-hmm. electrolyte okay. formulations and things like that. So, you know, ketones are efficient fuel for the mitochondria. And if you enhance mitochondrial biogenesis and a mitochondrial function, that's increasing your energetic capacity. And if you give uh, an alternative fuel in the form of beta-hydroxybutyrate, that could maybe further augment ATP production. If you're coupling, you know, ketones do enhance, you know, mitochondrial function and maybe, you know, sure. some biogenesis and stuff. So it seems like that could be a potential synergy. So this is something that I've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks, as I delve into the urolithin A literature mm-hmm. of different ways to mm-hmm. not maybe even we work on engineered, supplemented, modified ketogenic diets that are higher protein for different disorders. But so augmenting, you know, these metabolic therapies, dietary therapies, but also maybe using urolithin A as a component in our exogenous ketone supplementation protocols too, whether that be for cancer uh, or or neurological disease, it seems like a interesting direction to go into, I think. I 200% agree. I think, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I, in my former life, I used to work on uh, a lot of these MCT enriched drinks for, for cognition, oh, yeah. for, for mm-hmm. a bigger company, <laughs> yeah. much bigger than uh, what the timeline is. But uh, the idea was you could rewire, uh, refuel the, the brain uh, with a different source and that would result. And so definitely I, I haven't really followed the research, but I think it's progressed well from what I hear from you. And definitely I see yeah. potential in combining some of that application mm-hmm. with the uh, with Eurotonite. Yeah, I know Nestle is kind of all over the MCT. I remember we hosted them well over a decade ago. Just, you know, they were looking at different uh, MCT based compounds and yep. making uh, really helpful uh, formulations for that could be used in, for example, pediatric epilepsy and other sure. yep. things. So, um, so I guess I'd like to finish, you know, just talking very general about your uh, thoughts, being an expert on the uh, immune system too, uh, and just mitochondria in general, like things that people could do that could just augment and and enhance mitochondrial function, like your top three to five (laughs) things that, that, you know, from your experience would. Well, I I certainly think there's what I say, three different pillars. One, you have to eat the right diet, right? So you talked about it. So Mm -hmm. you should definitely keep eating your, your healthy diet, rich and you know, a lot of antioxidants, et cetera, uh, and fiber, of course, that nourishes the the microbiome. And and that's one bucket of things that you, should, you need to eat healthy diet. Second is physical activity. I mean, that's by far, I, 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 before we started the whole clinical program, we actually took 70-year-olds who were training for a 
half marathon since they were in their thirties. Uh, and we looked at their muscles and their mitochondria and was mind boggling that, you know, it's, I still think it's one of my best trials and compared to 70 year olds who were sedentary, the mitochondria looked mm -hmm. in such bad shape. So exercise is, is definitely one of them. Uh, and, and on the diet where you, you're working on sort of uh, some of the therapies is, is, is also key with sort of intermittent fasting or ketogenic diet. The third bucket, which is where I think can be used as not a standalone, but as a supplemental, uh, which is sort of advanced cellular nutrition and, and these advanced mm -hmm. nutrition, right? So I, I personally think if your mitochondria are in good shape, you'll even absorb multivitamins better. You'll absorb, mm -hmm. you know, other nutrients better. So take whatever you're taking, just add on a, a, a higher layer of these sort of cellular focused nutrients that I think by rewiring your mitochondria and then stress, sleep better, less stress, you know, sleep better. These are probably the top five things you can social circle, believe it or not. Uh, it, yeah. There are studies mm -hmm. about all that stuff also. So Johan tells me cold is good for you. Uh, Professor Ulrich mm -hmm. tells me that uh, cold is good for your mitochondria. So maybe that's a yeah. sixth one additional. And sauna too, heat therapy. Yeah, sauna yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, great. I mean, this is very much in line with kind of what uh, many topics that we discover or discuss and, and yeah, uh, sure. new new areas of research, especially on like cold therapy and, and sauna. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, Dr. Say, I want to thank you for your time today and, and covering a very enlightening topic, something that's relatively new to me. And I've very much uh, impressed by the amount of research that you've done and the overwhelming research on PubMed, on your lithin uh, A. And, uh, and timeline nutrition is just making a just top tier supplement that makes this uh, compound available to everyone. And um, I'm excited to see the research advance on this on multiple applications. So yeah. thank you again for your time today. And uh, how can people uh, learn more about sort of your research and, and, uh, the supplements and kind of what you guys have going on in the, in the yeah, future? Sure. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure to, to, to chat today with you. Uh, people can learn more about uh, Timeline uh, Nutrition by going to Timeline.com. We uh, are, um, have a whole set of blogs and science-based. Uh, you can follow all our studies on our website. And if you really want to go deep into the science, you can go to mitopure.com, which is uh, the commercial name for Urolitin A that we commercialize. And you can access all the deep research there. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Dr. Singh. It's been a pleasure interviewing you yeah. today. Same here, Dominique. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Metabolic Link with Dr. Singh. If you like this episode, please be sure to leave us a review, share it, and drop us a comment. And if you want more content like this, including access to our private podcast feed that offers exclusive ad-free episodes that also provides continuing medical education credits, CME credits for physicians, please visit our medical education platform, The Metabolic Initiative. Uh, at membership.metabolicinitiative.com. Your first seven days are free. Thanks again for tuning in. Do you love learning about metabolic health? So do we. It's why we created the Metabolic Initiative, an online educational platform providing evidence-based education on metabolic health and therapies for healthcare professionals and the general public. By joining the Metabolic Initiative, you'll gain access to hundreds of expert lectures, interviews, panel discussions, and even private episodes of the Metabolic Link. CMEs are available. Go to metabolicinitiative.com to get started. And as always, thank you for listening to the Metabolic Link.